Welcome to the Urban Agenda, a production of the Community Service Society of New York. I'm David R. Jones, president of the organization and your host today. Today's show will examine what's happened to Dr. Martin Luther King's dream for America. Have we lost the war for civil rights? Here to help me answer these questions is distinguished law professor and best-selling author Derek Bell. Dismissed from his post as a Harvard law professor because he protested the lack of any tenured African-American women professors, he is now a visiting professor at NYU Law School. Bell writes about his experiences of racism in his latest book, Confronting Authority, Reflections of an Ardent Protester. Thank you very much. Okay. Professor That's, Bell, it's really wonderful to have you here today. That, the, that question, it's the theme of your show, uh, causes me to think uh, the reality is no one is even asking the question, much less trying to uh, answer it, what happened to Martin Luther King's dream. And that's probably a pretty uh, uh, sad but uh, accurate way of summar summarizing um, uh, where we've gone for in the last 20 years. Well, what is your gut sense? What, what went wrong? Clearly well, we were, when I was coming along with Lonnie Guineer and the rest, we thought we were part of the movement that was going to change oh, I, America. I did too. In fact, when I graduated from law school in 1957, I went up to see uh, uh, Judge William Hastie, the first sure. black federal judge, a very sophisticated man. And I told him in my interest of being a civil rights lawyer, he said, Derek, praiseworthy, but you were born 15 years too late. The Brown decision has been decided. Exactly. There's some mopping up to be done. What happens throughout history, though, David, is that during economic good times or during national crises, uh, the recognition of the need for blacks to have basic rights mm -hmm. increases. During economic bad times, uh, it goes down. During the last, latter part of the 19th century, you could almost trace the economic conditions in various southern uh, regions by the number of blacks reported lynched. Now, we don't have the lynching today of right. the same form, uh, but uh, as Americans generally become understandably anxious because of the loss of jobs, uh, their unwillingness, even Business Week had a, a, sesh, uh, a cover story last week about the inaccuracy of government uh, statistics. Uh, the, uh, it's very easy, once again, for politicians to deflect the attention from their own failed policies to the uh, traditional scapegoat, black people. Now, given some of the reports that particularly the, the wages for uh, people of middle and moderate means and working class people is perhaps will not grow again in our lifetimes, what does that portend for the, the nature of race relations? Well, I think How that, do you fight this? I think that we are looking at a repeat of a century ago when um, uh, historians uh, indicated that this was the Black Nadir during the 1890s, uh, the first decade or so into the 20th century. And we seem to be repeating it for some of the same, the same reasons. Uh, it's very easy to conclude that, well, uh, as in it, the conclusions were made in the, the Plessy v. Ferguson decision, right. that blacks have enough rights that the Constitution could provide. Now it's up to them to pick themselves up. And, and here go, we go, go again. On your own. Yes, I think we are. In, in your book, uh, Confronting Authority, Reflections of an Ardent uh, Protester, you suggest, and I think an interesting statement, that uh, racism not only hurts, uh, obviously, blacks, Latinos, and others on the receiving end, uh, but it can also hurt the majority. Oh, yeah, it, that's the easiest thing to say. The hard, I mean, if I could get that message across, uh, you could carry me away. I would think that my, <laughs> my mission as a teacher were, were, were complete. Uh, but it is very tough. It's been very tough throughout history. How did you, how would you have gone about getting the white indentured servants, formerly indentured right. servants, now the yeoman, during the middle 1600s when slavery was just getting underway? How could you convince them that they were being sold a bill of goods by the plantation owners who said, hey, we're going to reduce these blacks to lifetime indentured slavery? And you got to stand with us in case they try to escape or revolt. Right. And, and we're going to let you uh, vote. We're going to lower the poll taxes. Well, once they agreed to that, they were, they were always going to be economically uh, uh, subordinated. They could, couldn't afford slaves. They were never going to be able to compete. And we have that same pattern down through history. We have it again today where the reaction to 
the wholesale shipment of jobs uh, out of the country, the wholesale importation of legal and illegal aliens, the downsizing, the uh, automation, uh, the response to all of that is, well, it must be affirmative action. That's, that's and, and, and people buy it. Uh, I guess it's not accidental, and I've heard this discussed, that uh, at this very time you suddenly hear sort of uh, these uh, bizarre uh, quasi-scientific notions of black inferiority uh, starting to come to the fore again. Periodic. Period. I was down in um, um, uh, Athens, Georgia right. last week del delivering the Hunter Holmes lecture honoring Charlotte, uh, uh, Charlene Hunter uh, Gold right. in uh, Hamilton Holmes who integrated uh, the University of Georgia in 1961. I can't right. believe that much time has gone. I was a, a junior attorney working on that case back here in New York. But in any event, I was reminded that also in 1961, there was a Savannah school case that I was working on. And the board, school board, hired all of these, in quotes, experts to come in and put on testimony, which the local judge allowed them to put on, proving that blacks were genetically inferior Included in that material was IQ test results. And uh, uh, the argument was that Brown should be rejected because uh, the court hadn't considered uh, the fact that blacks were in, uh, inherently inferior, as these tests showed. Well, the courts rejected it at the time. But there has been a periodic uh, uh, falling back to these uh, kinds of uh, tests. You know, it's the interesting th comment I, I want to make about the Charles Murray book. Right is that since his bottom line is really let's get rid of welfare, let's get rid of affirmative action, uh, let's put blacks back clearly into the, into the corner, that he could have made those same arguments even if he had manipulated the data uh, the other way right. from the way he manipulated and came out and said, well, blacks are 15 points higher right. than any white. And therefore need nothing. That's right. He, so he could have used the same argument. So it's, it's not the IQ test. Right. It's what's behind and what is the force behind. Uh, and that is, uh, it, it's just an anti-black thing. It, it's interesting how people, uh, we have no historical memory sometimes. Uh, and clearly there are other ethnic groups in, in the United States who have suffered uh, similarly. For instance, uh, I did my senior thesis at Yale Law School on Chinese exclusion. And much of that, the passage of legislation that prevented uh, the Chinese from immigrating was based upon scientific evidence. Uh, the scientific mm -hmm. evidence at that time, at the turn of the century, however, was phrenology. And it showed, based upon the bumps on the heads of Chinese, uh, by great experts, most of them at Yale, by the way, uh, <laughs> that, they were, that they were prone to, to violence yeah. and sexual assaults. Yeah. Uh, and that was used as part of the justification for not, not uh, clamping down on the number of Chinese coming into the United States. Well, Jews face the same problem. Absolutely. And I, the I, Irish. I, IQ test <laughs> and what have you. So it's nothing new. Right. I think it doesn't make it less dangerous. Understood. Given the uh, media's willingness to pick it up and the media's functioning based on what they think their audience is Wants want. to hear. And they, and, they, and they give it to them. I see uh, uh, Mr. Murray's book is number three on the bestseller list now, yeah. and I think obviously that por portends uh, for quite a struggle. Let's talk about uh, what we do now. Clearly, uh, uh, African Americans and other subjected groups have never laid down and let this happen easily. Uh, what do progressives, yeah. what do people who don't like this kind of America that's starting to build, uh, which, as you say, won't only sweep down uh, poor blacks and Latinos, but will hurt a lot of other people. Yeah. Uh, what, I, what do people start to do to <clears throat> confront these issues? I think that there are, there are is in any um, catastrophe, right. there is opportunity. And I think that the results in the election last week, some of these other developments that we're talking about, uh, serve as a, a wake-up call uh, for an awful lot of people of color as well as whites uh, who are, are progressive but perhaps have uh, been sitting down on the job or bemoaning the fate of, uh, of where even the people they elect have, have gone. Uh, that this means a, a, a massive effort of, of self-help, beginning with the individual. In my book, I talk about what happens to the individual protester, the person that stands up when everybody else is sitting down, who speaks out when everyone else is silent. Well, basically, it's not good. <laughs> those in power <laughs> retaliate. Right. Uh, those who you would hope would align themselves with you uh, uh, back off and, 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 um, and perhaps become hostile. 
Nevertheless, there are, there are marvelous values in, in standing up. And rather than wait until new leaders come forth, until new organizations are formed, I think that the, uh, the invitation out there now is that in whatever way we can, we as individuals need to reach out and do what we can to start moving things in the other direction. Well, you say, what can one person do? Well, it's amazing what one person mm -hmm. uh, can do once they're willing to do it. People say to me, well, Bell, you gave up your job at Harvard. Uh, have they hired anybody up there? The answer is no. They say, well, then you lost. I said, no, 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 I didn't lose. A whole generation of students, not only at Harvard, but at law schools across the country, know what I uh, stood up for. And whether they're willing to do it right now or not, they know that that is an option that has been given to them, not simply in lecture form or preachment form, but through example. And I think we, so I've already heard uh, myriads of stories, letters and all, about people who decided, based on reading what I did, to uh, to uh, confront their bosses or, or somebody else in authority who was abusing them. Right. I think and two things. I, I give, uh, there is hope, uh, and I see it also with young people I talk to. I see the same kind of uh, sense of eagerness to take on challenges as I did right. in the generation we came along in. And I don't think they're, they can be happy about the kinds of trends, which interestingly enough already starts to impinge upon other values that we're, we were starting to move mm -hmm. towards, particularly support of women and a more yes. e equitable workplace and a, and a more humane society of that sort. It doesn't, uh, this kind of uh, shift doesn't stop and target, well, as soon as we finish with the, the problems of the African Americans, yes. that we won't go to other parts of the social agenda that were tied up with that. And I think there's going to be a growing understanding that you just can't delimit, well, that, you know, the, the blacks are not doing so well, but women are still forging ahead in the society, and other protected classes are doing just fine. It's not going to work. No, I think it rolls back. I think one of the uh, uh, happy points of a, a rather sad Tuesday was the support that uh, Carl McCall got from large segments of the Jewish community right. in response to the really vicious campaign launched by his uh, Republican uh, uh, competitor. And I think that we need much, much more of that. There's been too much focus on who, what Farrakhan said or right. didn't say, and very uh, too, mu too little uh, uh, recognition that blacks and Jews are really uh, in the same boat. That is, we are both outsiders, right. and that the uh, uh, one group certainly has a lot more in the way this society measures success. But if the deal goes down, if, if blacks go down, I think there's still going to be a need for scapegoats. And uh, the traditional scapegoats, I think, are, are, are Jews in a it, It's also clearly an anti-urban move as well. Yes. That's also sweeping in, that the values of, of urban life in America are being brought up to question, uh, that we seem to want to go back to a much simpler time uh, when everyone thought it was uh, uh, women were in the home, the men went out to work, everyone came back to a suburban or yeah. rural home, and the values were all there. Of but course, they, they, uh, they don't talk about the bad no, stuff. You can't that. go home again. You it's, can't uh, go home that again. The, the fact is that the uh, urban uh, society is a necessary part of modern society, mm -hmm. that the, uh, you talk about jobs, we're going to need to look for alternatives to jobs. Uh, we may be coming to an end of jobs, at least to the extent that we once measured any individual's success, uh, their well-being, their status, uh, even their self-esteem by what they did. Uh, in, many of those jobs are now disappearing. And that right, Labor Secretary Reich obviously talks, has written very extensively on the problem of who's going to be able to work in the new 21st century. Right. And clearly the need of, of highly skilled workers is what, what it's going to be, just at a time uh, when public education, particularly in the inner cities, is deteriorating uh, incredibly. Uh, but it, it was interesting, I, I did get the chance to testify down in Washington uh, before a congressional committee on equity in education, school financing. And my staunchest defenders turned out to not be the Democratic members of the committee, uh, but two junior Republicans who were representing blue-collar communities uh, in the Rust Belt, uh, who said, basically, uh, we don't know about all this stuff about uh, minority children, mm -hmm. uh, but our kids are getting lousy education. Only a fraction of what's being spent uh, on their education, uh, of, of what's uh, happening in neighboring communities, and they're staring out into space with no new jobs. Yeah. And I think that's ultimately, hopefully not too long, is what's going to turn the nation. 
where we realize we're, we're facing a common uh, problem here of ill-educated young people who can't yeah. participate in the economy. And even, even with the quality jobs that Wright talks about, he's not giving us the full story. Right. The fact is that one of these skilled jobs replaces 20 workers, right. maybe 30 workers, you see. And that this, there has to be something, uh, some provision made for them, uh, even for those at the top. Otherwise, those at the top are going to be brought down. It, and, uh, in support of that notion, uh, I come from, my people come from Barbados, in the West Indies. And we learned shortly that, um, uh, that one of the big airlines started to do all their data entry work there and ship back the information by microwave. Yeah. Why? Because the wage rate was about a, a third of what it is for minimum wage worker here. Uh, but moreover, the literacy rate was uh, one of the best uh, in the world. And they didn't need to check the error rate with yeah. uh, these workers. But I think all over the world, a number of economies are focusing on uh, the skills of their entry-level workers in a way we have them in Singapore and parts of the West Indies and other areas where they're focusing on their wage uh, primary education, uh, much more so not only than an inner city child here in Brooklyn, or, but also in just a ordinary community. We're just not uh, training them very well at this point. You know, it's, it's, it's the short run is very profitable. The long run is... Uh, um, let, let, let's talk specifically disastrous. about the African-American community and what it's going to do. We're, we're sort of at a, at a particular uh, nadir in, in a lot of ways. Uh, we really have our, our traditional uh, leadership, uh, particularly from things like the NAACP, um, to a lesser extent the Urban League, uh, have not been uh, out front yet on these issues. There's been a major disruption, obviously, in the leadership of the NAACP, but it's a culmination of a, a long history long of history. problems. Uh, how will those organizations react, in your view? You know, I think that the NACP did mention one, is that what is happening at the top is really unfortunate. But as you say, um, uh, it's been coming for a long time. And if we want to be perfectly honest, the NACP is always in some little turmoil, turmoil. at the top. Right. It's, it's always been the branches uh, that have been the main support. Those, it's to the local branch the indiv individuals go with their complaints. It's the local branch that reaches out and speaks to public... Uh, accommodations, personnel, and to uh, employers, and what, ha what have you. And I think to a uh, great extent that's going to continue uh, happening. Uh, I would hope that uh, some of the suggestions that Roger Wilkins has made about the, putting the operation at the, at the national level in, in, into receivership, um, ha um, having a blue ribbon group come in, it was a little conservative for me, but the <laughs> Blue Ribbon Group, who would be able to uh, come up with a new board, a very small workable board, make recommendations for uh, uh, new leadership. Uh, that, that can happen. But if it doesn't, uh, I think the local organizations will, will start will continue to emerge. on. And the other part of it is that there are really a lot of local uh, leaders and, and groups don't get very much attention and what have you but that are working away, doing uh, a Herculean uh, a task. And I think that these will probably get more support as both things get worse right. uh, and the uh, traditional organizations uh, fail to function. One of the other interesting things that's emerging is clearly can their a coalition be maintained or forged between Hispanic Americans and African Americans uh, facing uh, many of the same problems in terms of poverty, uh, uh, lack of education, political powerlessness, uh, but clearly seen as one of the fracture lines uh, in terms of uh, efforts. Very difficult. I think it is with the coalitions with whites, it's certainly worth uh, trying. But again, uh, the great uh, sense of individuals coming into this country is that I want to move up, and the way to do that, uh, one of the ways is to, as Toni Morrison said it, uh, the second word you learn is nigger, and that you feel that you're superior to this as, as a guy who may have been here for 300 years. And uh, that's, uh, that was a very attractive way to go for Europeans, right. who were the same color as those who were already here. Right. For people coming with a different language, with a different color and parts, uh, it's going to be even more attractive. So that while we may bemoan the failure with both with uh, Hispanics and Asians, uh, we can embrace and applaud 
the few gains along those make. lines have been made because it really will be tough. I don't think the fact that America is going to be mainly minority by 2020 or whatever makes, makes a bit of difference. If so many of those who are, are people of color are busy trying like mad to identify with those who are white. I guess that raises a question. Uh, one of the other outcomes of the recent election was a, a uh, California piece of legislation which would uh, severely restrict uh, particularly the rights of undocumented aliens for basic protections. No, it's a, again, it's, it's the frustration. I mean, if you don't even have to know very much about Supreme Court decisions to see that that almost certainly is going to be declared unconstitutional in whole or in substantial part. And yet the, the sense of, of, of uh, upset and rage uh, that can be channeled uh, to, to uh, a relatively powerless group and the same people who are doing the channeling were those who a few years ago were, were encouraging the importation of illegal aliens to, to do work at, at dirt cheap prices. So that the, uh, at this, this idea of waking up, uh, what's the expression that until white people get smart, black people can't get free? Well, I don't want to wait that long, but there's still a lot of truth in that. And so that one of our main tasks is going to, while involving ourselves in self-help here, also doing whatever is possible to try to get whites to see today what, their, what they and their predecessors haven't been willing to see for 300 years. Understood. What would Dr. King say about all this? How would he be positioning himself to, to try to help and bring some changes? Well, one here? thing is clear. He would not be saying what uh, President Clinton had him saying at the Baptist Church. Why those guys didn't get up in politely because he's president, ask him to leave, I do not know. Uh, Maybe for, for our audience, you'll yeah. refresh there. Uh, well, they, you remember Clinton went to this Baptist convention right. and said, well, if King were here, he would be appalled that black people are killing other black people, and, and that's not what he fought for freedom for and what have you. Yeah. That's, you know, it's the most scurrilous, uh, hypocritical uh, thing imaginable. I mean, if he were a dumb man, uh, uh, yeah, perhaps you'd let it pass as ignorance. But he is not dumb. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact is that we forget that King, uh, at his death, and probably death was caused by his recogni recognition that uh, uh, racial equality uh, was going to be impossible without economic equality. And he would be even more convinced of that today because the gap in the, the wealth, the gap in income between those at the top and the rest is as bad as it's been at any time in this century. And, and, and the gap continues to grow. Right. And if those who were elected last Tuesday have their way, it will grow even, even larger. Mm -hmm. So that I think that he would be greatly concerned because of the lost ground in terms of economic opportunity that have occurred in the last 20 years. I guess when I, I, I look to my 14-year-old, I'm trying to present to him and my daughter, nine, what they should be preparing themselves for. Uh, in your view, as you, you're, you're dealing with students every day, how should we start to get them tough enough and ready enough yeah. Uh, to confront these kinds of challenges that really we, we, we weren't setting it up this way um, and I think I speak for many uh, professional and middle class uh, uh, black Americans uh, who were interested in this issue and fighting this issue we thought our children were going to have all options and didn't have to worry about these struggles clearly that's not going to be the case how should we start tooling them up to handle this it's very hard but I think that the the answer is in most religious teaching that life is challenge and that here is this array of challenges we didn't think you were going to have to face but there they are right. uh, you may get over them you may not but your success depends on not the fortuity of, of success or failure as the society measures it but the degree to which you commit yourself to doing it to making it better to to reaching out where you see injustice where you see wrong getting trained for that purpose changing jobs for that purpose the, the remarkable thing about it, and I think it's my experience, I think it's Lonnie Guinier's experience, is that if that is your aim, to make it better regardless of the risk, regardless of the criticism and, and, and the rejection, somehow, in many instances, you end up even doing better on the bottom line of your career than if you had played it safe, uh, taken stuff that you really shouldn't have taken, accepted injustice that you shouldn't have accepted and all. So that the, the message, and it's, it's, it's hard, I have three grown sons, mm -hmm. the, the message is to, is to reach out, try to make things better in your job, 
try to do it with as much integrity as well as as much energy as, as, as possible. And the rewards are, some of the rewards are guaranteed. The reward of feeling better about yourself is guaranteed. The reward of, of, of bottom line success is, is less guaranteed, but it occurs often in ways that we would, would never expect. I've heard reported that you actually told Lonnie Guineer not to take the Harvard position. Is oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, that was, it, was, it was actually falling through on exactly what you've said. Yeah, I, I thought that uh, uh, they having uh, really done a serious disservice to two of her black women uh, counterparts, that if they wanted her there, they should not ask her for a visit in which she would have to be subjected to a year of scrutiny, a person of her, her achievements, that she, they should do for her what they've done for these white males and offer a permanent appointment that she can either accept or, or, or turn down. Just to confirm your, your belief, I did a little uh, sort of historical retrospective of people I came up with through school. And the ones who, uh, in many cases, who stayed closest to the corporate model uh, often were destroyed. Uh, some yeah. of them very uh, real profoundly sad stories um, and I do think there's uh, there's an upside in struggle uh, yeah. which is not only uh, one where you're doing the right God's work here or doing moral things but that basically it's, it's tapping into the, the needs of people who will b yeah. buoy you up and I, I think perhaps it's it's been lost in this period uh, well that's a, that's a, we can start with our children and, and try to reach I try to reach out to my students it, it, uh, it who, is listen, inter who yeah. listen a lot more than my children it, too, it's I interesting think. though that <laughs> some of the latest proposals coming uh, out of now a conservative Congress uh, are going to frighten a lot more than work, uh, working in poor uh, blacks no, I think uh, so. the notion that has been propounded and floating out there of setting up national orphanages or mega yeah. orphanages uh, uh, to handle uh, minority children all sorts of ideas that that uh, hark back not even to this century, uh, that right. actually hark to other more terrible times, I think will bring uh, new uh, adherence to uh, this struggle. No, I, th I think that's, I think that's right. So, I think even though it, Oliver North didn't make it, right. uh, which is a, which a blessing. Uh, Ted Kennedy did right. uh, make it. So that uh, all is not lost. The, uh, the area of struggle is, is great, but the few big victories indicate that it's worth pursuing. Thank you, Professor Bell. It's been very instructive. Thank I hope you very we... much. Today, some 40 years after the birth of the Civil Rights Movement, we're still struggling with race issues in America. Clearly, we still do not provide equal education and opportunity for all our children. Too often, these issues founder on the rocks of racism. This nation needs to strengthen and contribute and seek the contributions of all of its citizens uh, to face a highly competitive world. To write off even the least of its people diminishes all of us. This is David R. Jones. Thank you for joining me on The Urban Agenda. comment on the urban agenda or for more information on CSS, contact Community Service Society of New York, 105 East 22nd Street, New York, New York, 10010, area code 212-254-8900. Yes, I think we're in, in your book, uh, Confronting Authority, Reflections of an Ardent uh, Protester, you suggest, and I think an interesting statement, that uh, racism not only hurts, uh, obviously, blacks, Latinos, and others on the receiving end, uh, but it can also hurt the majority. Oh, yeah, it, that's the easiest thing to say. The heart, I mean, if I could get that message across, uh, you could carry me away. I would think that my, <laughs> my mission as a teacher were, were, were complete. Uh, but it is very tough. It's been very tough throughout history. How did you, how would you have gone about getting the white indentured servants, formerly indentured uh -huh. now the yeoman, during the middle 1600s when slavery was just getting underway? 
how could you convince them that they were being sold a bill of goods by the plantation owners who said, hey, we're going to reduce these blacks to lifetime indentured slavery, and you've got to stand with us in case they try to escape or revolt. To deflect the attention from their own failed policies to the uh, traditional scapegoat black people. Now, given some of the reports that particularly the, the wages for uh, people of middle and moderate means and working class people is perhaps will not grow again in our lifetimes, what does that portend for the, the nature of race relations? Well, I think How that, do you fight this? I think that we are looking at a repeat of a century ago when um, uh, historians uh, indicated that this was the black nadir during the 1890s, uh, the first decade or so uh, into the 20th century. And we seem to be repeating it for some of the same, the same reasons. Uh, it's very easy to conclude that, well, uh, as in it, the conclusions were made in the, the Plessy v. Ferguson decision, right. that blacks have enough rights that the Constitution could provide. Now it's up to them to pick themselves up. And, and here go, we go, go again. On their own. Confronting authority. Reflections of an Ardent Protest. Thank you very much. Okay. Professor That's, Bell, it's really wonderful to have you here. That, the, that question, it's the theme of your show, uh, causes me to think uh, the reality is no one is even asking the question, much less trying to uh, answer it, what happened to Martin Luther King's dream. And that's probably a pretty... Uh, uh, sad but uh, accurate way of summar summarizing um, uh, where we've gone for in the last 20 years. Well, what is your gut sense? What, what went wrong? Clearly well, we were, when I was coming along with Lonnie Guineer and the rest, we thought we were part of the movement that was going to oh, change I, America. I did too. In fact, when I graduated from law school in 1957, I went up to see uh, uh, Judge William Hasty, the first black sure. federal judge, a very sophisticated man. And I told him in my interest of being a civil rights lawyer, he said, Derek, praiseworthy, but you were... Welcome to the Urban Agenda, a production of the Community Service Society of New York. I'm David R. Jones, president of the organization and your host today. Today's show will examine what's happened to Dr. Martin Luther King's dream for America. Have we lost the war for civil rights? Here to help me answer these questions is distinguished law professor and best-selling author Derek Bell. Dismissed from his post as a Harvard law professor because he protested the lack of any tenured African-American women professors. He is now a visiting professor at NYU Law School. Bell writes about his experiences of racism in his latest book. Born 15 years too late. The Brown decision has been decided. There's some mopping up to be done. What happens throughout history, though, David, is that during economic good times or during national crises, uh, the recognition of the need for blacks to have basic rights mm -hmm. increases. During economic bad times, uh, it goes down. During the last, latter part of the 19th century, you could almost trace the economic conditions in various southern uh, regions by the number of blacks reported lynched. Now, we don't have the lynching today of right. the same form, uh, but uh, as Americans generally become understandably anxious because of the loss of jobs, uh, they're unwilling to see even Business Week had a uh, sesh, uh, a cover story last week about the inaccuracy of government uh, statistics. Uh, the, uh, it's very easy, once again, for politicians 